Kids, a good morning to you. Welcome to Asake Online. My name is Zenzel Ndebele and this is the Breakfast Club. We know these days we are really struggling as a country to contain uh, the COVID uh, disease or the coronavirus, which has affected many families and many people. I know you know someone who's sick, someone who has tested positive recently, or even someone who lost their life because of this disease. And we really encourage people to, you know, to stay strong, not only that, but to follow the, the COVID protocols. Make sure you social distance, you always wear a mask, you know, and I, I always encourage people that recently I, uh, you know, there was a, fam a funeral in the family and I went to a funeral. Uh, this thing of Futa Wandivar, Kogi mask, so living, I'm a Kalapande, or at West, Abandi mask, here will up. We always encourage people to be vale, I'm a Kalalom make sure that the mask is tight and the, you know, Agungeni Luto. So this is what we encourage. And social distance. You know, church. And I ask myself, at least what are they really getting into? So we really encourage people to to make sure that we, we follow these protocols so that we don't spread the disease to the other people, but also we can be able to contain it. And that way, the faster we contain it, the faster we go to normal life. And today in our program, we'll be talking to a frontline worker. You know, every day we, we hear about, you know, frontline workers. We know that going through difficult time, you know, working every day under these conditions. We're talking about nurses, we're talking about doctors, we're talking about most of the people who work in the health sector. They are really strained, you know, trying to save lives and, and all these kind of things. So today in our program, we'll be talking to Dr. Mbongeni Ndovu, who's, a, yeah, of course, he's a doctor. And he'll be sharing with us his experiences ever since the COVID, uh, COVID pandemic started. How he's been work, how is it difficult interacting with clients, knowing that any other client who can walk in your office is actually a, a COVID patient. So it becomes difficult for nurses, for doctors to work, but the work is still has to be done. So let's hear from Dr. Ndovu how COVID has changed his work. When we started in uh, hearing about COVID, in December 2019, a lot of fear filled uh, people's, uh, I mean, minds and hearts. And obviously, we're all afraid. We're still being the, in the medical profession. We didn't know what kind of a disease it is, although we're reading about it. So, but it finally landed here. And we moved from fear to adjustment, to getting used to the disease, and now we're treating patients. We're now seeing real patients, yeah. And then we started treating patients, especially in the first wave, started treating patients. And uh, there were very few of them. So we got used to the disease, to the processes that need to be followed. And uh, now coming on to the second wave, we've moved from getting used to the disease, but now the second wave is actually struck people very hard and uh, we are getting fatigued and tired and worried as well. Why? Because it's unusual, it's, it's very unusual to see healthy people just sniffing the virus and they are gone. And uh, we're still if it strikes closer home. I think uh, with this second wave, we've lost colleagues and we've lost, uh, I mean, nurses and doctors. So it, it's becoming worried some, and we're getting increasing numbers of patients that are admitted, that are dying. You get phone calls from all over. So I, I, I remember one of my friends said uh, in, in vernacular, saying that COVID is a task, basically meaning that this COVID it's no longer interesting. <laughs> you know, a disease <clears throat> can be fascinating if you are treating and people recover. But right now we're inundated with a lot of patients. So it's really no longer nice. Yeah, you, you mentioned the first wave and the second wave. And what do you see do you see you know, a big difference between the, the, the two? You know, the first wave and the second wave? De definitely, definitely. I, I, I mean, if you look at our first wave, uh, we did admit patients, for instance, in hospital, but not to the levels we have. Like, for instance, in one of the hospitals that where I work, we had to, we never filled up the ward. We've got a 14-bedded, 16-bedded uh, hospital uh, uh, ward for COVID. 
We never failed that. But right now we've spilled on to an, the next ward and we've got patients on the vent, which we rarely did. And then we, we've got quite a lot of deaths now. And even nationally, you can see that right now we, we, we were in the first wave way below, I mean, uh, around 5,000 or so. But right now we are hitting 31,000. This is These are official figures that have been tested. But believe you me, there are lots of patients that have not been tested. We cannot access testing right now. There's so many people that are walking around, quoting the words of the Deputy Minister uh, of Health in Zimbabwe, who said every part of Zimbabwe is a hotspot. That is true. We are seeing lots of patients that don't make it into the national statistics who are just recovering or dying at home or that kind of thing. So definitely the second wave is a lot of a difference. You know, I, I, we used to say when the first wave started, ah, it's the elderly, you know, it's people with the conditions. Um, do you think it's still the case or it has changed completely? It is. It is. If you look at, uh, by and large, uh, people who are, who are dying of the disease right now, <clears throat> they still remain people who are at risk. That is, the elderly, they are looking at uh, those that have got preconditions, diabetes, hypertension, kidney disease, and uh, that kind of thing. They are these ones that are still dying. And But when you look at uh, also... We've got young people that are dying that have got preconditions. And one of the major preconditions, especially in young age groups and similarly in the elderly, is obesity. People that are overweight, they are hard hit by the disease. So it's still actually that. Yeah, I mean, what I know people are scared to you know, test and sometimes you, you get tested and you go home. So what would you say to someone who has just uh, tested positive? What would you uh, encourage them? What should they do? I think by and large, people, yes, are scared to test, but by and large, people are, cannot afford testing. Because if you look at a, a, a PCR, it costs 60 US dollars. That's not even the salary of, uh, of uh, some of the people that are working here. So how do you spend 60 US dollars on a test? And uh, the cheapest, like the antigen, costs about 20 US dollars. Still, the step. So, by and large, people cannot afford to be tested. And, but right now, if you test positive, there's a few people that actually ever get tested. If you test positive, the best thing that you should do is to keep calm, don't panic. And um, it depends. I mean, if you are young or you've got preconditions or you are elderly. So don't panic. So you need to isolate yourself first. So meaning that uh, you need to protect others. Think about others, your family members and the community at large. So isolate and then uh, watch the things that you should actually expect. For instance, like uh, it's a flu-like illness. And then you get flu, fever, dry cough, amongst other things. You can actually even get diarrhea right now. A loss of sense of smell, loss of taste, and feeling tired and exhausted. That's one of the things that actually you should expect to do. So if you've got fever, headaches, you should take paracetamol. That should actually work. And then um, you find that the things that you should actually watch out for, people, when you're beginning to have chest pains, of course you get chest pains with a lot of coughing. But when you begin to have persistent chest pains, you begin to have shortness of breath, difficulties breathing. So these are the things that actually you should get worried about. Then you should seek medical attention. I should say that you, you don't just rush to your doctor or to the hospital. It's even better if you call, if you can, call your doctor and say, I've been tested positive or I've got symptoms that are, sound like COVID. What should I do? then they can advise you. That way you don't actually expose other people. Yeah, you're talking about, uh, you know, uh, people walking in here or, you know, exposing. As a doctor, you're used to dealing with people, you know, in a normal situation when there's no COVID and anyone who come here and present with all, all sorts of symptoms. Right now, you know that any person who walks here could be having COVID. How has that affected your work and the way you deal with clients? Uh, you treat everybody as a COVID patient. 
you treat every but as a covid patient i've got my mask on all the time after every patient we try to to every now and then sanitize skin the surfaces so you treat everybody and our practice has been affected in that remember we are people that are used to contact with our patients right now our examination our consultations are less to reduce exposure our waiting rooms with socially distanced patients will be waiting outside uh, you, our, uh, our our we, we, we don't unnecessarily examine patients we know we would examine patients open their eyes open their mouth look into your ears and stuff like that so we no longer do that and after every examination you just have to 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 to, to sanitize that's why we've got sanitizers even on the uh, around us all the time so it has affected our thing our 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 our, our practice of medicine you cannot say that uh, when we started initially we would say have you traveled have you gone but now with local transmission everybody is a potential case and you don't want to be told later on that oh that patient that you saw tested positive and that is too late so we treat everybody uh, as a suspect a potential case does it make you worry every day when you go to work that maybe you know being not not, <laughs> not really not really not really to be honest you'll be surprised <laughs> not really uh, i I'm, i'm not worried because not just patients because I remember actually i treat patients in a covid unit i have to dress up don myself get into a covid unit literally every day actually the covid unit i think as far as i'm concerned is the safest patient place to see patients because you are guaranteed that you you've got proper uh, I, i mean a, a, a ppe you get in there you see patients you are protected you, you you know their status but i think the danger is out there where patients walk in but we're not afraid i think as long as you take precautions and treat everybody as a suspected as a potential case rather without discriminating them but your patients our patients we are telling them they have to understand that where is not necessary we don't have number one to examine and secondly where is not necessary except for dire emergencies or some necessary cases you don't need to, to go and see your doctor Yeah, then there is uh, the issue. I've, uh, each time I've talked to people about the COVID uh, interviews, and everyone, everyone talks about the food, uh, ginger. From a medical point of view, are these things safe? Um, we are an African country, and uh, yesterday I was listening to a program actually on one of the national uh, radio stations where herbalists were talking about uh, how. They, they 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 treat covid and you know, <laughs> interestingly one of them was saying that uh, the from their traditional point of view you should not eat milk uh, because it increases your mucus and then covid is about mucus and stuff like that people everybody has got an idea about covid but i want to tell you that uh, if all our ideas worked we wouldn't be where we are right now we've got a lot of uh, Uh, zumbani umsuzwani around the, it's it's free actually there is lots of it if that thing worked we wouldn't be here where we are today why, why would you be dying like flies when we've got so many red, so much ginger lying around here but the truth of the matter is that yes i mean people use different remedies i don't want to discredit that but as a medical person we look at what we call evidence based medicine things that have been tried and tested and proven in a trial or a research that number one they work they are eff- they are efficacious and number two they don't cause side effects to people and uh, number three the dosages have been actually determined for the elderly for different age groups and also for people with underlying conditions like for instance kidney failure one of the biggest problems that we see in our nation and africa at large is that one of the biggest causes of kidney failure and liver failure are traditional medicines because people they actually do their easy hapa and all these kind of things and then they drink them i mean damaging their liver damaging their kidneys and stuff so we need to have measured things and also uh, I, i i i i saw i mean recently uganda they are trying one of their traditional stuff they are partnering with uh, some guys and uh, uh, determining 
I mean, its effectiveness in a proper trial. Why can't we subject our things like that? We can coordinate people uh, between the, the, the modern medicine and the traditional medicine, the Western medicine and traditional medicine, and see whether things work. But uh, for, if you want to hear my honest opinion about uh, steaming, ufuta, and stuff like that, remember, for flu, we always encourage the patients, even before uh, uh, COVID, we always encourage patients to steam. Why? Because if you inhale that steam, it loosens the mucus and the secretions, and then they cough them up. And they, many times they feel less stuffy, they feel less congested and stuff like that. So maybe as a symptomatic relief, it may help. But uh, to be honest, to say that you steam that heat and uh, it kills the virus. I've seen people with hoarse voice, voices after steaming for hours on end. What they're doing, they're actually burning their vocal cords. Some of them have developed ulcers in the nostrils, just uh, uh, taking up that, 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 that steam. You have to exercise extreme caution even when you're doing that. People can suffer burns even from that. Remember, steam is hotter than the water itself. So and we held that and then in uncontrolled quantities, you might end up in trouble. But I don't want to discredit uh, traditional practices. You know, this is quite uh, interesting because, uh, you know, I, I, I know people have been talking about this and one of the things are the dangers that you've just mentioned that, well, do it, but do it carefully. And uh, remember, last question is, we have seen that people, uh, they too much talk about masks, but people still need the police officer to arrest them to wear a mask. Why do we still have this issue of people thinking that it's someone who will get COVID and it's someone who has to wear the mask? I think many patients that I've treated, they will actually tell you that I've exercised extreme caution. I don't even know how I got this thing. And uh, I'm, I'm actually puzzled how I got this thing. And uh, they never thought it would be them. Like, similarly, ourselves, you never think it would be you until you get it. Like recently, I lost my, 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 my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Sururu, and my professor, Professor James Hakim, our father in medicine and our teacher. And when that happens and it strikes home, that's when you see what, this thing. So anybody is vulnerable. So, but people out there, they think that it can be somebody else. They can't catch it. And I've seen my heart breaks when I see people in queues we're still in buses and uh, find a wonder feet pegged. And we're still people bribing police and paying in order to go places and stuff. There are combis that are still moving right now with people with no masks. And uh, the greatest even issue are people who pay the bribes and the policemen that receive the bribes. And people, even if you increase the fine, we, we don't need to be increasing the fine for, for, for masks. People need just to be educated enough and see that this thing is dangerous. It kills. So, but coming to masks as well, there are masks that actually pe people should wear a mask properly. What I'm putting on here is an N95 mask. You can see that as I breathe, it collapses and expands. It's very hot, but I'm, I've gotten used to it. I can wait the whole day. But people tell you that the mask is hot. But this is, the, this is how hot it can become but I still put it on. But there are some of these masks that I've seen, everybody, there's no standard. Everybody makes a mask. Some of them, they actually like a, a, a rhino horn around the nose there. You find the air is freely circulating. It must be tight. You must have a tight fit around your, 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 your close your mouth and your nose, a tight fit so that you don't breathe. But half the time, the mask is improper. And secondly, it's improperly worn. And thirdly, when you put on your mask, don't touch the front of the mask because this is the dirtiest part of the mask. You find people touch the front of their mask. If you touch the front of your mask, sanitize. You sanitize to kill the germs. Why? Because this is the dirtiest part of the mask. Why do we sanitize? It's because our hands, they pick the virus from surfaces and then we touch our faces. It enters through the eyes and our mucous membranes like the mouth, the nose, don't poke your nose. Don't do those things unnecessarily or suck your fingers and stuff. That's why you can get the virus that way. Yeah, it's, it's quite <laughs> tricky because uh, these are the things that people do every day, you know, and they, yeah, and 
all sorts of masks that when someone goes like this and the whole face is, 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 is out. And I think we really need to be careful on what mask we can wear. But maybe lastly, uh, what would you say to someone who wants to test, but uh, they want to go and test for COVID, but they are just saying, but they don't test To be honest with you, it's, uh, it depends on why you want to test. Maybe you want to board a plane, you want to cross the border. But to be honest with you, if you've got symptoms of COVID and you cannot afford a test, you can call the city council. If they don't have the kids, what do you do? You sit at home, isolate yourself. Or if you have been exposed, you isolate yourself. You isolate yourself. And then when you isolate yourself, from the time you have got symptoms, for 10 days, you, it's been shown that the virus, the test might still be positive, but the virus is no longer viable from the time you get symptoms. Of course, if you've got severe symptoms, people that have got severe symptoms and the shortness of breath and stuff, it can persist longer, maybe up to 20 days. But for people that have got symptoms, mild to moderate symptoms, then after 10 days of isolation, you, you, you're good to go. So. If you can't test, then isolate. Then you practice that. As long as you follow what the symptoms do. But it's not a scary thing. It's an uncomfortable thing to be poked into the nose. But don't be afraid to go and be tested. Uh, thank you very much, Doctor, for your interview. And uh, it's quite uh, informative because we, we learn every day. And uh, as they say, that it's a novel virus. Uh, we still keep gathering the information. But for people at home, we always encourage people to always wear masks, sanitize, social distance. And if you can, stay at home because it's not necessary to be in town. My name is Zenzel Ndewele. Till we meet again on Friday for other discussions on COVID. I'm taking COVID. Have a good day.